We're excited to introduce our concluding keynote speaker. Natasha Vita Moore is a designer and theorist. She's a professor at the University of Advancing Technology, chairman of Humanity Plus, and a fellow of the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies. She received her doctorate from the Planetary Collegium, University of Plymouth, where her thesis focuses on human enhancement and radical life extension. She is the designer and author of Platform Diverse Body, Substrate Autonomous Person. In 2013, she co-edited The Transhumanist Reader, Classical and Contemporary Essays on the Science, Technology, and Philosophy of the Human Future. In 1983, Vita Moore authored The Transhuman Manifesto and founded Transhumanist Arts and Culture in 1993. She was the chair of Vital Progress Summit 2004, establishing a precedent for discussion of human enhancement and president of the Extropy Institute from 2002 to 2006. She has exhibited at the National Center for Contemporary Arts, Brooks Memorial Museum, the Institute of Contemporary Art, Women in Video, Video Telluride Film Festival, U.S. Environmental Film Festival, and Evolution Haute Couture art and science in the post-biological age. She is published in more than two dozen journals and a contributing author to numerous books. Please warmly welcome with me Natasha Vidamore. Oh my. Oh my, had I known he was going to read the entire thing, I would not have, did I give you that long thing, that long verbose? Um, hi everyone. I was trying to gather people from outside in the hallway in because I always think it's nice for the last talk of a conference for the chairs, organizers, and team to have as many in as possible. So I was missing the end of the last talk, so please forgive me, uh, speaker. I wish I'd heard the last, but I was trying to wrangle. Okay, so here we are, the last talk of the day. Um, let me get some logistics worked out first. Is this timer correct? This one here that looks like a uh, Colorado license plate. Okay, good. Thank you. It is a pleasure to be here, and I want to thank everyone, Lincoln, and the team for inviting me. I've heard so much about this conference and the scholarship and the dedication to the Mormon Transhumanist Association, so MTA, two thumbs up. I wasn't sure what to talk about, but I decided to use my own experience as a segue into answering a few questions that were presented to me, which I will show in my second to the last slide. One thing I've gotten out of today from the various talks since I got here um, just before noon is the use of the term we. And every time I hear the, hear the term we, I go, wait, I don't believe that, or that's not me, that's not my story. That may be his story, or her story, or your story, but it's not my story. So we all have this type of reaction when we hear we, or you. No, wait, wait a minute. We're moving targets to associations and assumptions about who we are as humans in our lives, especially when it comes to our moral values and some of the ethical issues that have been touted around for the past 20 years about biotechnology and transhumanism, human enhancement, what we will become, the suppositions and theoretical underpinnings of questions that have brought about the postmodernist age to its knees, thank goodness, finally. This is our role, this is our job, to take those who did provoke us and offer solutions to the narrow-mindedness of modernism but not to discount the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, and the many benefits of modernism. And then on the other hand, postmodernism has offered a tremendous amount of value in raising the ceiling, uh, more interest in feminist studies, gay and lesbian studies, diversity, multiplicity, the issues that face us as a culture. It's our story. It's my story, it's your story, it's our story. And we are in it, individually, separately, with our own backgrounds, our own references our political, religious, and moral dictums based on our experiences. So these form our stories. 
Looking at transhumanism, it's extremely diverse. I was talking to a colleague earlier today who gave a talk, Julio Pristio, about the fact that we are so diverse, and how delightful that is, that we are diverse. We are not of one religion, we're of multiple religions and views, or non-religions and views. We are many politics, not just one, right or left, up or down. We are growing more varied and collaborative in our thinking. And as we look at the rules and regulations, the guidelines, the uh, statutes that we create in our future, they will be even more diverse than anything we've seen in the past. Why? Because we're becoming more diverse and we're accepting each other more readily than ever before. So that's what excites me and that's what I see in culture and every time I look at each person I see something different. So in my view, we are not a we, we are an I, we are a you, we are an us. Taking that one step forward, let's see if I can work this so the goal to build stories based on first-hand experience rather than what someone else did. Let's not parrot each other. Let's form our own experiences. Have you ever heard a term used by someone who you think coined it or came up with it to only find that person read it someplace else and then think that person coined it or came up with it only to find it in another book? I did that with the term transhumanism or transhuman. Um, I questioned its use and its history, and my mother, who is now 95, and I, back in the 1980s, I think it was 1984 and 1985, somewhere around there, we researched and found the term transhumanism in Reader's Digest way back in the 1950s. We found it used in Allegheny Dante's poetry. We found it in even T.S. Eliot's The Cocktail Party, very famous poetic story, a play. So that was transhumanized, transhumanar for Italian, but it still means transcending, overcoming something in different ways to be sure, but that's what we are individually. We're transcending and overcoming something that we see in ourselves that needs to be altered one way or the other, and then we adjust, we adapt, and that's part of what our species does. That's what part of life does. So we're strategic, we're instinctive, we're humorous, we have irony, hyperbole, logic, passion, desire, needs, et cetera, et cetera, as our stories unfold. One of the most interesting aspects of creating a story is to look at who we are and why we're here. And probably the biggest story of our time is life and death. Creating synthetic life, oh my goodness, wow, who would have ever thought that we could actually create synthetic life? or that we could defy death, that we could redefine what the meaning of death is, how the word is used, how it's even evolved looking back over time from when a person was thought dead. What did they do back then at the turn of the century? In graves, they put a bell outside with a string going into the grave just in case someone woke up because they found a person that they thought was dead was not really dead, just in a comatose stage. So we now regenerate hearts with electricity, zap zap. We bring people out of comas, we put people in comas. We transfer blood, we grow blood. Think about skin. Skin is our largest organ, it protects us, it regulates our body, it's our thermometer. It also is the first organ to be grown, the first organ to be cloned, the first organ to be engineered, the first synthetic organ. It's a pretty marvelous organ, is it not? But how did this come about? Because of someone's sad story. We usually design or engineer solutions to problems immediately when we see them. We start thinking and we get an idea and then we figure out how we're going to solve it. Burn victims have suffered over the years, whether it's from war or fire. They have suffered over years from skin damage. So smart engineering, engineers in science and medicine, developed ways to grow skin and transplant skin, even synthetic skin to help protect people. I was looking yesterday at a part of a brain, a prosthetic um, bone, a skull, for people with a certain disease where their bone becomes very large, maybe five or six inches thick. So instead of having that deformity, you have it cut off and have a plastic skull put on your head. So we're redesigning the body, redesigning the idea of death, and rethinking life. What if you could die for a short period of time and come back? What if there was partial death? What if life could come and go? 
in different modes, different realities, different platforms, different substrates, as Randall suggested with whole brain emulation and his project. So when I think about life, we think about for human life, our time frame is a century. That's not very long when you think of all the things you love to do and to think, for those of us over 50, whoops, oh, half of it's gone if we're lucky enough to live longer. So, in short, if we're going to extend life, this precious gift that we have, this miraculous thing, this agency, this energy that we're alive right now, wow, that is so amazing. How can we protect this? How can we own it? How can we be part of a species that starts developing an incredible respect for our own lives, our identity, our personhood, that we would go to the extreme lengths to develop ways to preserve it? Now that, to me, would be what you all might call a miracle. To me, it's common sense, for goodness sakes. We will do anything to help someone who is dying. We will go to the end of the earth to help our loved one survive an injury or a disastrous disease because we love, and love is our gift. It what unites each individual together as a unity, as an understanding, as an acceptance. If we're going to live longer, what are we going to extend? What is this thing that we are in this life? Lynn Margulies said, one of my favorite scientists, a woman indeed, said that we grew out of the, the mire as bacterium, a conglomeration of bacteria forming that bacterium, and we evolved over time through that. And yes, indeed, as another speaker said, we are part of the cosmos. We have every element of the cosmos, or maybe not every element, but let's say if we go down to the most minute aspects of physics, yes, we do, in our bodies, all around us. So if we look inside the body, we're starting to notice ways that we can possibly regenerate it through stem cell cloning, through regenerative medicine, telomerase, engineering, prosthetic parts, growing skin, 3D printing organs. It's endless, the ideas that are in front of us from innovators thinking about life and preserving life. This is my body, by the way. So this person that we are, no matter what your belief system is, this identity, this uh, consciousness, this mind, that each one is. What are we doing with it? What, what is, what's there? Now, Randall tried to tell us, excuse me, a little bit about it. Oh, I can't move it, okay. It's not touched on screen, sorry. Okay, um, so let me see if I can pull out or something. So, uh, pull back in, no, it won't do. Okay, there we go. Um, this agency that we are, if we had a metabrain that could transfer, upload, download, sideways load, our identity, the functions of our brain, what is our mind, the mechanism, functionality of our memories, and the processes of our cognition, then would that be us? But without a body, we wouldn't have our senses and perceptions, so our body is very important. This is my brain, by the way. In thinking about building a new body for life extension, and thinking about the brain, and the vital aspect of it being memory over time, continuity of personhood from a philosophical concept, we think, okay, we can build bodies because we are doing 3D printing just about of organs, but certainly of elements that are building up to organ cells. And if we have robotic AI-driven prosthetic parts that are very smart, used in the Olympics, for goodness sakes, the Paralympics, if not the whole Olympics, I was in Moscow recently talking about a superhuman Olympics to the conventional committee of the, um, the International uh, Olympics. It's going to happen. So here you are sitting here thinking how to pull in your value systems, your morals, Mormonism, religious views, and spirituality to new types of bodies that we're going to put our brains in and hopefully our consciousness, and hopefully those bodies will offer a sensation or perceptual sphere that we will be able to communicate with each other in ways that we do now and new ways to yet to be seen. So 
What does this mean about death? We'll have to redefine it and the tools and the systems developed to expand persons across platforms and substrates. In different types of mechanism, I see as an autonomous process because each one of us has a certain level of autonomy with it. We will decide for each one of us what we want. What you want, I want us. Each individual has a choice. It's not a collective. It's not part of a religious practice. It is a responsibility for yourself with your own story and bring it to the fold of your group indeed. But find your own story with it, for goodness sakes, because that is the preciousness of being alive as an individual. Okay, so what next? In um, 1997, I designed Primo Post Human, the first uh, future human prototype. I had a very strong scientific team, technological team, leaders in artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, biotechnology, genetic engineering, stem cell cloning, philosophy, um, engineering, uploading, Hans Morovic, Marvin Minsky, Ray Kurtz, no, and I didn't have Ray, no, he came along later. Um, Hans Morovic, let's see, Robin Hansen, Eric Drexler, uh, Peter Voss, Max Moore, uh, and others, Greg, Gregory Stock, all thinking about what is this personhood that we're going to carry on in a different sphere, a cybernetic sphere, a computational sphere. So in my work, I took the body, and it did quite well, but it wasn't enough. It wasn't my story. It was the beginning. It was the introduction. It was the premise, the prelude. It wasn't enough for me. But one might ask, why did I do it? And I'll explain that in just a moment. But the body wasn't enough because neuroscience and cognitive science started catching up to other areas. And as the explorations into these fields grew, I started working with my brain. I had numerous MRIs back in the 1980s, 1990s, got into uh, stronger abilities with neuroscience, um, to working with the neuroscience team on thinking capabilities, memory loss, et cetera. And the issue to me was memory. And I look at my darling 95-year-old mother who has these memory gaps. I think, what's going on? What's going on in there? And then I think of, if we're going to extend life over time and eventually build new bodies, what is this memory that we want to protect? Preserving life, protecting memory. That's pretty much who each person identifies with him or herself. So, okay. Doing my research, I thought, okay, what am I going to do next? What could be the next chapter after having designed this future body? That wasn't enough for me. So what I decided to do was to take my previous work. Let me use the pointer here, if I can, there. Future body design, body by design, my body, my brain. Observe, think, fill in the box, physiology, okay. What can I'm training myself, working with plasticity and my own thinking? I'm a cryonicist. What's missing? Okay. And that's the creative part of each one of our journey in our field and our story. What are you not doing that you want to do? What goal, aim, trajectory, creative project, intellectual project have you been thinking about in the back of your mind that's been gnawing at you that you haven't done yet, that you keep putting off? Don't put it off. Do it now. Each moment that you're alive is precious. It can be gone at any moment, and I know this. So do it. Don't stop. I did. So I thought, okay, what could I do that would be pick up on someone else's work that wasn't finished? What could I do with my interest in this and these areas? And I thought, okay, memory. If it boils down to one nugget of truth, for me, that is our memory. Each moment, okay, there's one, okay, there's another one. As I look around the room, I see Mike, I see Lincoln, I I'm looking around, okay, but a moment now, I'm remembering that I looked at Mike and Lincoln and Julio, okay. If that is so essential, and then we tie it together in our brain. Now, this is short-term memory and working memory, but it filters into long-term memory, and we associate it with images. If you're a visual person like me, if you're audio, you listen to the sounds, the crunching sounds, the whispering sounds. If you're a kinesthetic, you have an emotional reaction to the light in the room, the, the sound of the floor, the feeling that you get. This is our perception. This is our sensory makeup. This is why we need a body. And whatever environment we, in, we will be in, we will not be an upload without a body. We have to have an envelope. It's how we communicate. So right now, right here, what was missing? Memory. 
So an experiment had been talked about with C. elegans with cryonics and memory. Now, C. elegans are a very famous nematode worm, and Randall had a picture of one in his slide. It looks kind of like this one down, oh, right here, I think we had the same picture, yes. This little worm, dirt worm, is so spectacular. It is a connectome. It doesn't have a brain. It has a whole body that's made up of neural, it has a neural fabric. It's a very chemical organism. So its brain is its whole body. Its neurons are interconnected as a connectome throughout its body. Okay, it's born, it's very short-lived, a couple of weeks. It grow, it's born as a hermaphrodite, grows in, stays a hermaphrodite or is grown a male. Very few males are grown as male to start with. Uh, usually um, differentiates into a hermaphrodite. It has several short stages, L1, L2, L3, L4, and then it's an adult, and then it dies. Um, you can chronically suspend it. It's been um, one of the organisms that has been successfully put into cryonics, vitrified, and brought back. Very successful. So I set up a lab at Alcor Life Extension Foundation, and I presented. Of course, I got a grant for it, worked very hard on my proposal. I've been working on it for several years with uh, world's leading um, cryobiologist, I can't mention the name, but uh, we've been working on this since 19, I mean 2004, and finally, now's the time. I've got the lab. I have a lab tech in um, Spain who is superb working with me. He's right there. He's going to be coming back to help me with this. We are vitrifying this worm, and we're training it. So we vitrify it, train it, vitrify it again, test it, see if it remembers. If our experiment is successful, that will be one small step in my story. It'll be a chapter. I have my preload. This will be a chapter. I don't know what I'll do after that. I just want to keep on trucking, keep on going, you know? Keep the design work going. So there are times when we change our careers. I'm a designer. I was an artist to start, became a theoretician, bored me, became a designer. Love it. I love design. I see everything as design. It is engineering, it's problem solving, looking at gaps, looking to find solutions for what's needed. I have no desire for fame and fortune. I, I only wanted fame as an artist. When I quit being an artist, I let that go. <laughs> that was kind of a funny joke. But I always wanted to solve problems since I was a little girl. So I found a problem, and I can't solve it by myself. Certainly, I'm working on the, the previous work, documented scientific research of uh, the particular vitrification process we're using, which is called cryotop. Cryotop method is used for embryos, very successful. It's the top method in uh, infertility. Uh, the success rate for our C. elegans is very high. We're using these particular straws that were invented by Ramon Risco, Dr. Risco in Spain. Uh, very successful. We're picking up the worms one by one. They're microscopic. So it is not an easy task. And you put the, <laughs> the, the <laughs> straw in your mouth and you suck it. You got to get it right in a certain area of the straw and hold it there. I do have this on video, but I did want to take your time with it. But it's incredible to work with this worm. They are beautiful to move. And I don't have a video in here because I didn't want to take the time for it, but they dance when they move. It's a beautiful motion, and when they, you don't know if they're making love or they're dancing together or what they're doing, but I just want to tell you one little story here. One of the worms we vitrified last month and re, uh, resuscitated, it was very happy we put it in our agar petri dish, and it was very still, and if it gets straight, you know it's dead, but if it starts curling a little bit, that means it's, we still have hope, and you're, you're hoping that it, it lives. You want it to come out of the vitrification, out of the cryonics, alive. And um, it came out fine. It was moving around the arger in the petri dish, leaving a trail. And I saw two little kind of circles. I thought they were air bubbles. And I said to my colleague um, from Spain, what is this? Air bubbles. Then I started seeing them move. The worm, the nematode, the C. elegans that we vitrified, that we resuscitated, was pregnant and laid those eggs in the Petri dish when we put it in there for warming up, warmed it up, put it in the dish, and gave it time to see if it would wake up and come up. And those two little baby worms lived. And it was beautiful. <gasps> I mean, that's the moments in life you're just going, oh my goodness, now, now, that's life. The reason I got interested in 
designing a whole body prosthetic in 1997 is because I lost my baby. It died inside of me. And it's a horrible experience to have a life form die inside of you and almost die. I was in intensive care for two weeks in Japan, of all places, where my surgeon stood over me when I'm in intensive care, you know, give me morphine, morphine. And I could hear him say, look through my English um, Japanese dictionary that I had in my bag where they found me on the floor of a restaurant in a dark, musky hallway in a restaurant with slanted eyes staring at me. Um, looking, 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 and said, basically, you may not live. Okay, those words, you may not live. I hear them. Each moment when I look at the human body without looking at your faces, just, you know, each body, I know that something could be going on inside of it at any moment that we don't know about. I was at, at that time, the top of my career, but, you know, you keep on going, and life is like that. You get a top, and then you wait, you kind of hang out for a while, find a new direction, get to the top again. It's, it's a fun movement, this synthesis of life and the iterative process. But what I, I it taught me the biggest lesson ever. Of course it did, duh, but it really... Um, resonated with me that we're walking around with in this biosphere of vulnerability and we are so incredibly fragile that we don't know moment to moment if cancer could break out and by the way I've had cancer twice survived it two different cancers survived both of them but we don't know so you go to the doctor like me you have your body checked everything checked I'm very um, focused on health and what I eat, but I also love chocolate and drinking and whatnot, so I have to, you know, I'm, I'm doing a balancing act constantly. But I want to enjoy life. That's fun. But at the same time, you don't know what you're doing. Could it hurt you here, over there? How much to lift weights? How much not to lift weights? What to do? It's a continuous process. It is so iterative. It is design. Life is design. Not intelligent design, but it's, it is. We are living as designers of our own life, and we can write our stories and build our stories based on our own personal experiences and find the value and passion in each one of our lives and contribute to transhumanism. From your perspective, that's what we need. So now let me move on here. So these are the questions posed to me, and I'd like to answer them quickly. Time check. How much time do I have? Okay, good, excellent. Okay, so now let me stop here and just ask you all. Does anyone want to ask me a question afterwards? You'd rather me just continue talking. How many want to ask me a question? How many want me to continue talking? Okay, if you want to interrupt me, raise your hand. That's perfectly fine. I do not find that rude. If you yell at me, okay, that, that won't be rude. Okay. Um, what can religious spiritual groups... Oh, I have to span out. Let me see if I can do it with this. Oh, okay, good, good. Okay, what can religious, spiritual groups and, tra uh, and transhumanists offer each other? Stories. Let's share our stories. We talked about myths today. We talked about understanding. We talked about empathy. We talked about the cosmos. There's a lot of different rich discussions today. The myth really enticed me. Thank you. So we need to build new stories, a new literacy for transhumanism. That's what you can help with. We need more empathy. We need more consciousness. We need more passion about us as individuals and what we're doing. Um, how we can interconnect with our own set of ideas. We each have so, we're a wealth of information, each one of us, with our own personal narratives, this big, big build larger narratives. Okay, so I think that's paramount. Let's talk and share. Let's not dictate to each other or use we too much, and I do it too, So, but let's just be careful there. But let's appreciate each other for each individual's experience firsthand. Okay. Uh, what is the overall strength and weaknesses of religious aesthetics? I changed the spelling on aesthetics there. And how might they integrate with uh, transhumanist aesthetics? Oh, gosh. Okay. Um, I think what I love about religious aesthetics is walking into a Gothic cathedral. Wow. In Paris, walking into the Notre Dame, looking at the rose window. Wow. And the gargoyles outside on the roof. The architecture, the vestibule, the choir. Oh, the music of religious groups singing 
is just, I mean, it, it rips at your heart because it just, it just gives you chills all over, especially, I can't even think, I'm not religious, so I, don't, I can't think of the songs, but when I hear them, I know um, what they are. There's one, um, Adia, um, so sung every Christmas, a Christian Catholic, maybe. Um, but they're beautiful. Um, so the architecture, the stunning um, style, the sound, the acoustics, like the acoustics in here are really fabulous. Uh, the lighting in uh, many religious halls or spiritual locations, um, like a temple, walking to a Buddhist temple, it's just, it just it's riveting. Um, a lot of the, the fashion and the style is so beautiful to look at. The ceremony is something that um, can influence transhumanism, this, the ritual. We need more ritual. We need more ceremony. Um, not in the sense that there's a master and a slave or a guru and an underling. I think there, the God is within all of us, this, this, this whatever it is. Um, so if we're part of the cosmos, it's all in all of us. So have, oh, and one thing I wanted to say, MTA, you have a darn good designer. Whoever came up with this logo, I mean, hallelujah, praise your Lord. That is amazing design. I love it. The font, I have to know what font that is. Also, the, um, the, the flyer, nice paper laid out beautifully, nice two-inch margins. So these things I notice as a designer, good quality paper, beautiful um, banner. Uh, that is so important because it can be appreciated, so it's the aesthetics um, in the structure, architecture, sound, etc. Okay, and the ritual there. Um, how might they integrate with transhumanist aesthetics? I think we'd have to be very careful there because I'm someone who doesn't want to have a guru or, you know, whatever. I, I, I want to share. So um, I think that probably um, there is a story to share. Let, let's open the discussion on that. Perhaps. Okay, what is my own narrative story? Well, I think I just told it to you, but as far as spirituality and religion is concerned, my background is I was brought up in Episcopalian. I was confirmed um, in the Episcopalian church. I left the church when I was 17, uh, maybe 16, because I didn't want another man telling me what to do. Um, I was a very young feminist in high school. Um, Martin Luther King was assassinated my senior year in high school in Memphis, Tennessee, where we, I was born in New York, but we had moved there. Um, and seeing the way a black person was treated, an Afri African American was treated in the homes of people where they worked, they were treated like really well, <laughs> I have to tell you, really well, like nannies and, you know, aunts and uncles. But out on the street, I never saw a black person on a bus in Memphis. I never ate with one, never in the bathroom, certainly not in my high school, never at a party. They were not allowed in our restaurants. So when Martha Luther King was assassinated, I became very radical. And that's when I became very um, an activist. That was my first act of activism um, because I was there. It was my senior year in high school. And... Um, the rioting in the streets, whatnot. But my second act of activism, activism was about the mentally ill and physically deformed. I did a lot of charitable work when I was in high school. I was president of my sorority and queen of the fraternity. I was very social-minded. Um, you know, the South, you have all these. I wore evening gowns a lot and cocktail parties, uh, cocktail dresses. Um, but it's very social-minded. I saw that, and the way the blacks were treated it really bugged me. So in Memphis, there was a place called the Home for Incurables, and the people were so deformed that they were not allowed out in public. Well, that would never happen today. It would be politically incorrect to say home for incurables. Incurable? We're curing so much today. It would be an oxymoron. However, I did a lot of work for this particular institution. Uh, my father did a lot of volunteer work for uh, St. Jude's Hospital, Children's Cancer Hospital, and I as well for many different organizations for people that were not born at the level of what we call normal normalcy by the Western world's concept of what is normal for the human. I was born um, a little bit sickly. I was sick most of my life. Um, my first plastic surgery was when I was 11 years old. I had a tumor growing in my face. I went to, my surgeon was in Chicago, was one of the top plastic surgeons for this type of growth. Um, fast growing bone in my jaw, half my jaw was taken out. Luckily, I was pre-puberty, so my jaw grew back. But I had, a, I had a sympathy for these people. I understood because I, in the waiting room at my surgeon's uh, location in Chicago, saw many deformed 
irregular looking people early on in my life. So that's another reason Prima Post Human and designing future bodies, thinking about people with, who are injured in a car accident or go to war and come back with half a body, that this is just crazy. Come on, they need a new body. And it's beautiful and wonderful and fabulous that we are doing that. Thank goodness to the developers and designers and prosthetics and AI and haptics and neurological connections with the prosthetics. Okay, and um, how could technology enhance religious thought and practice? Oh, wow, that's a big one. I think we've alluded to it a lot today with, you know, just seeing what's going on um, in many ways, exploring the cosmos. I'm a very big space activist. I've been to space camp, uh, pre-astronaut training in the 1980s. Um, I was hopeful nothing happened with the space <laughs> industry. It's coming back, thank goodness. But um, I think that the more we learn about the micro the long, and the more we learn about the macro, the more we will understand ourselves. So uh, looking di uh, deeper and deeper, deeper into the molecular and further, further, further out into the cosmos. Um, it's, but I think the answer to that question is already stated, and I couldn't say it any better than, than he did. Okay, what are the, um, I'll read it here, what are the es essential conflicts between science and religion? I think the, the essential conflict is if in science we have to prove, we do our experiments over and over. I can't just vitrify a worm and train it to do something and say, oh, it, you know, take my word for it. I feel it's there. I believe. I have faith that it, it's. You, know. you can't do that in science. You have to repeat it at least five times. That is scientific discovery. That's science specific fact. You have to prove it. Um, in religion, it's, it's based on the more the feeling, the emotions, the hope, the dream. The, um, it's, it's our psyche. Uh, so we can't prove what the mind is, but we kind of think the mind is what the brain does, the function of the, you know, cognition and memories and everything. So this is all gray area. So that's the central conflict, okay? It's like art and design. Art is all about your vision, your work, you know, you don't have, you know, artistic license. You don't have to prove it, you just do it. And design is all about solving a problem and having a strategy and seeing that strategy through and results in the iterative process. If it, you know, keep on making it better, resolving, resolving. Okay, so what are the essential conflicts and can they be overcome? Oh, I can't wait and see. <laughs> yeah, I think that's already been explained today too that I it probably... Um, thinking about all the particles in the universe and understanding if there is intelligent life elsewhere um, and is it, how will it be? And if we, uh, if, not if, but when we do build AGIs, you know, will they um, have a level of understanding that will help us better understand our own selves? So um, I don't know. I'm with you on this, you all, or those of you who don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know. And I'll close with this. This is my book, The Transhumanist Reader, which was mentioned in my introduction. It's an anthology of 41 authors, and it is, um, I highly suggest it is the first academic book on transhumanism and the history of transhuman, the currents of transhumanism and the future, including concepts like the singularity originated by Werner Vinge, upload originated by Hans Morvik. Um, it has a debate between uh, Remy Kurzweil and Eric Drexler in it. Um, Randall's in it. Julio's in it. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a wonderful combination of ideas. So it covers many of the topics we've covered today. Uh, it's published by Wiley Blackwell, academic publisher, which is fabulous. Um, we were hoping to go with MIT at the last minute. They backed out, but I'm glad because Wally Blackwell is, is such a great publisher. I'm very honored and proud to have them as my publisher. Um, so what else can I say about it? I think and I hope that it, it does provide some solid background on transhumanism and the foundations of it because there's so much misinformation out there. There's a fact that Humanity Plus has that was originated from the transhuman email list back in the early, mid-1990s that um, was um, Nick Bostrom added to it and um, then James Hughes added to it and World Transhumanist Associated added to it and then took away from it but not all the facts were accurate because there was, back then it was very political and there was a schism between um, certain political views and I'm so glad we're beyond that and that's a sign that there is intelligent life in the universe. You know, it doesn't matter what your political views are for goodness sake, let's get her done, you know, as someone else referred to CS. Uh, C.K. Uh, Lewis, Lewis, 
C.K. Lewis, get her done. Okay, so um, good book. I hope you get it. Um, and uh, I have no more to say about that, but I think you'll enjoy it. It is a little bit academic, and one person on um, Amazon criticized it for listing all the PhDs in it. But listen, when you're doing an academic book and your publisher is academic, they want to list all the PhDs. So um, we tried not to just look at PhDs. We tried to look at a scope. And there were so many other authors that we wanted in it, so we will do another follow-up book and pay tribute to the other thinkers here that we just didn't have room for um, then. Okay, so that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, five minutes left. Does anyone have a question? Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, there. Uh, yeah. Okay, right. So I would say things that you have to repeat then for the recording. Okay. Does it work? Can I use your accent when I repeat them? Can I go back? Yeah. Now, I want to come back to your last point about the conflict between science and religion. And uh, you made the experiment, you made the example of your experiment with the worm and said very rightly that uh, science is about experiment and religion is about hope. Uh, my point is that uh, there is no necessary, uh, necessary conflict between these two things. On the contrary, they do and should support each other. Because uh, you would not uh, spend uh, all the resources and do the experiment if you don't hope that the, exp that the experiment succeeds. And now, suppose the experiment fails. Suppose you find out that the worm does not retain any memory that it had uh, formed uh, before being suspended. What would happen is that since you hope that eventually you will succeed, you will do the experiment again and again and again. And you will do it until it will succeed. And at the end, the experiment will succeed because of very strong hope that you have that uh, what you're doing will eventually succeed. That's very well stated. Um, so what was just mentioned is that there is a synthesis between science and religion because science is based on a particular um, perspective to, it's driven by an imagination, a, a, a concept, a desire to make something happen or prove something. So within that is the idea of hope. You hope it'll happen. So, but you have to put that hope aside and prove it. And if you fail, it's very sad. You can get pretty depressed about it or sad about it. You know, some people do, you know, get very upset about it. Um, we're, religion also contains the element of science that there is a search for truth. There is a search for repeated patterns. Um, and we see that very often in a lot of uh, religious lore where you'll see something and, and hope it comes back again in prayer, um, listening to a message being given to you from God to answer your prayers. There's a level of a science in that one could say that if God repeatedly answers you, then there's a repetition and you could say that you can measure it quantitatively and qualitatively as too, as well. Um, but I'm sticking to my story. <laughs> I think that there needs to be a separation between them. And I think that's okay. I think what you really mean here, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is that we need both. They can remain separate concepts, but they do work together and they have to work together because you're not going to do a scientific experiment without a level of hope and desire. You hope, you know, you have a, a dream. I have a dream. <laughs> we all have a dream. You have a dream. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, so I was just going to ask you what you think of the, the idea that um, I talked a little bit about earlier, which is that science, maybe without even knowing it, is sort of taking on certain kinds of religious functions in the ways that, for example, um, scientists often go far beyond just speaking about what they're discovering to talking about what that might mean for us or you know so religion talks about attributing often tries to attribute meaning to things that happen to us and yeah, I think yeah. science tries to do that too in some ways what, what are your thoughts on that yes I agree with you I, I think that's very correct I think it's science as well as technology just to throw another element into the mix it seems very much like science and technology if I may um, do have this element of what we would call religion to them based on 
our hope, our faith in them succeeding, and we're, we often talk about um, ways, let me rephrase that, there are journalists, I'm correcting myself here as well, there are journalists who often write about those who are interested in technology like transhumanists and, and futurists as being religious about it. Uh, making it the next religion, like the singularity as being a religious, you know, epiphany, um, like uploading and becoming superhuman, wanting to be gods, um, the myths of gods, man becoming gods or human becoming gods. Um, in that image, and also looking for a type of redemption, salvation, resurrection, all these elements, you could say cryonics, for example, or even bringing someone back through, um, you know, out of a, a, a comatose state or, you know, uh, revamping their heart, um, re-energizing people at whatever level, whatever disease, you could say that could be a resurrection of them. Um, so we're seeing this in action right now. So we are, we are in the story right now. We are the science fiction of years gone by. We're living it. So is that religion? To me, it's, it's, it's just life. You know, I, I'm not, I never like say, I'm, saying someone's a libertarian or a Democrat or a Republican. I'm not, I'm not any of them, and I've never been any one religion after I left the, walked out of the church that day. I want to learn about as many of them as possible and pick and choose the elements that I need in my life to help me live a better life. Um, I think we need to be careful about putting too much faith into a certain technology solving a problem or a science, you know, um, acting like it's, it knows our future. I think we need to be very careful about that. Yeah. I think we're out of time, right? Or, okay. No. Sorry. Oh. Okay. oh, sorry. Sorry. Another quick, okay. This, this one's actually pretty quick, I think. Okay. Um, you've worked with Alcor and, 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 and the cryonics at all? No. no, I'm not. I'm just. A, I've been a member of Alcor since 1991. I don't work there. No, I was looking for a research lab to to do this C. Elegans project. I went to 21st Century Medicine and I looked at other labs and applied for grants. And the only grant I got was from Alcor, from their research team, which I was just delighted with. But it, uh, you know, I've been working on this for years. Finally got a grant, and. Um, so it is, I, I built, uh, we set it up at Alcor, so it's so research center. Do you, have, do you have more than hope? Do you have actual science? Yeah. That specifically that Alcor is able to preserve oh. micro features that are important? Oh, okay. So I can't speak about Alcor. That's, I'm not, I, I don't work at Alcor. I'm not an expert on that. But I can speak about cryonics or vitrification, let's say, and C. elegans. That's my only level of experience. Um, yes, after you vitrify a C. elegans, the nematode, the worm, and bring it back, it moves around. If it's going to lay eggs, those eggs hatch and they're healthy, life coming out of them. And it's, you can tell by its movement. Um, if it's jerking, it's got a problem. It's a very sensitive uh, creature to the chemistry of the environment. So, you know, like behavior, we study behavior. If, if someone is sitting here agitated, I'm gonna go, they're agitated. If you're sitting there relaxed and looking and smiling, then I know you feel healthy and good, you know? So, now, if I was a um, chemist, I would be able, or a geneticist, I would be able to look inside the worm at its genes and see the connection between the neurons, what's going on as far as the chemistry of it, and that's a whole other area, which would be another chapter by maybe uh, Arizona State University in their uh, biodesign lab. But I'm just working at this one area of it, and yes, it is science. It's very hard science. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, MTN.